Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV. Today I'm talking to David Eagleman, a professor at Baylor Medical School. David, thanks for talking to me. Thanks. Uh, you uh, do a lot on neuroscience and the law. What's your basic uh, research project? The basic idea is to understand how modern neuroscience affects the way we think about criminal behavior and new ideas for criminal punishment and rehabilitation and even how jurors make decisions. So I'm trying to, this is where our understanding of neuroscience, this is where the rubber hits the road, where we see how that makes um, sense for society to have evidence-based policy, an evidence-based legal system. What is the single biggest contribution that neuroscience can bring to a better criminal justice system or practice? I think there are a few areas. One of them is going to be introducing new ideas for rehabilitation. For example, we know that one of the things that characterizes most criminal behavior is very poor impulse control. So most criminals can tell you in a moment of sober reflection what the right and wrong thing to do is. They just have very bad impulse control. That's a place where we can actually help using cutting edge technologies in a libertarian fashion that allows people to help themselves by strengthening the long-term decision-making parts of their brain. That's one example. Another example is having rational sentencing by understanding how likely someone is to reoffend and basing the length of their sentence on that. This is already in use in courtrooms with essentially statistical or actuarial tests and we're using neuroscience to try to improve those even more. We'll never have 100% correlation because life's much too complicated for that, but at least we can distinguish who's a really bad seed that we want to lock away for a long time versus people who might not be and could use a shorter prison sentence. Uh, you, you talk about the uh, kind of libertarian sentiment or the idea the individual can be more in control of themselves, yet at the same time, does the, does the basis of neuroscience almost completely erode or at least seriously challenge another basic political libertarian idea about autonomy or about the idea that we are actually in control of our actions or ourselves? I'm afraid it does. Uh, the understanding from neuroscience that's very clear by looking at examples of brain damage or disease or stroke or epilepsy, things like that, or drugs, is that you are your biology and when the biology changes that changes you and people who otherwise behave in manner X you change their brain somehow and they behave in manner Y so all of this has taught us over a long period of time that maybe we're not the ones driving the boat to the extent that we intuit and of course people have been debating the free will question for a very long time I think it's very difficult to come down on one side or the other and answer whether we do or don't have free will but what I'm pretty certain about now is that to whatever extent we have free will, it's really only a bit player in what actually happens in people's lives. So is this a reinscription of Freud was famous for saying that, you know, uh, the, uh, I guess the superego uh, kind of rides the, the id, or the ego rides the id, and it kind of directs, it's sort of like a horse gets uh, direct, a wild horse gets directed by a driver. I mean, is this a, a scientifically more sound or more credible, at least at this point in time, version of, of Freud? Uh, that's exactly right. Freud got some things right and wrong, but what he got really right was this idea that most of your drives and instincts are completely inaccessible to you. They are the subconscious. Uh, we're not acquainted with those drives. Uh, and instead of it being like a rider on a horse, it's more like you're a little stowaway on a battleship. Um, the conscious brain just doesn't have that much influence over who you are. And so when you look at a criminal and you say, well, that guy, I, I wouldn't have done that. We should, we should make that guy hurt because he made a bad free will decision. It's not, clear that that's, it's not clear that your brain and his brain are anything alike. One thing that's very important is this does not exculpate criminals. As we develop a better biological understanding, it does not let anyone off the hook. Instead, we're still going to lock people away, but it allows us to do rational sentencing, to introduce new ideas for rehabilitation, and to better understand how to incentivize, how to structure incentives in the society. So that's the goal of a biological understanding. What, uh, you know, what are the implications for, a, say, a free market economy? I mean, if we're not really in control of our decision-making process or our behavior, um, you know, can you have a free enterprise system which is based on rational or, you know, semi-rational actors pursuing their self-interest? So it's pretty clear now that humans are not rational in their decision-making, but they are 
studyable and we can understand how people make decisions, one of the important points that often gets overlooked is that there's a real spectrum in the population along any axis that you measure. So some people will make pretty rational economic decisions, other people make very terrible intuitive decisions. And I think the important end goal for us in trying to structure economies and structure a legal system is to understand what the population actually looks like and how they actually behave. Obviously, as a, you know, as a scientific community, we've long ago given up the idea that we understand people as rational actors, because that's not the right. case. As we understand what they actually are, we'll be able to structure things pretty nicely. What would you say to uh, people who say, look, you know, this just sounds like uh, you know, a version of a kind of 60s liberal uh, mollycoddling of criminals, uh, you know, where you're saying, oh, they didn't do it, their genes did it, their brain did it, their addiction did it. Um, here's what I would say. Because we know the complexity of gene-environment interactions, there's no way that we'll ever be able to say, oh, it's their genes, or oh, it's their, we're not gonna be able to identify the root of it. So my suggestion is, what we need is a completely forward-looking legal system. We need to understand the human brain better so that we can say, given the brain that's in front of the judge's bench right now, what do we do with it from here forward? Given all the data we have from the past about people who have similar brains, what do we do with it now? So it's not coddling because we're still putting people away. What we are doing is we're not using incarceration as the blunt tool that it is currently used as. So instead of throwing everybody in jail with previously mandated sentences, we're able to modify it on an individual basis, put people away for longer, shorter time. We're able to introduce new ideas for rehabilitation, which is very important. Take something like the drug war. We spent hundreds of billions of dollars attacking the supply, which has shown uh, itself to be a failure in every way. What we should be doing is addressing the demand. Drug addiction is a real problem, but we can address the addict's brain. We can use rehabilitation there. It's not a matter of coddling a drug addict. It's a matter of fixing the problem, saving our society trillions of dollars and a lot of human misery. You have also, uh, uh, you're, you've published a, an incredibly well-received uh, fictional meditation on the afterlife, Some Can you talk a little bit about the book and where did that come from? Um, so Some is, is, is literary fiction and it's 40 mutually exclusive short stories and they all purport to take place in different possible afterlives. The key is that they're all mutually exclusive. Uh, the reason I wrote this book, um, it's because you know, I've devoted my life to science, but at some point the toolbox of science runs out and beyond the edge of that is everything that we don't know. And I've always thought um, the afterlife is an interesting example where people act like they know one way or the other what's going on. They say, we die, there's no afterlife. They say, there's an afterlife with clouds and angels and whatever. And the funny part is everyone's making it up and acting like they have certainty about something. So I wrote a book where it's 40 stories that are all mutually exclusive. All the stories are mischievous and funny. But what's serious about the book is the meta message, which is that it's a celebration of our ignorance. It's a way of shining a flashlight around the possibility space to say, you know, in fact, we know nothing about any of this. Do you believe in an afterlife? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, you I have no, no idea if you believe. believe. One way or the other. Oh, You're yes, agnostic. I have no reason to believe in any particular afterlife or if there is one. It's always great to uh, have scientists talk about the limits of knowledge. Uh, when we talk about science and its intersection with the law, it's a pretty unsavory history, right? Uh, you know, yeah. prefrontal, prefrontal lobotomies or, or psychiatric controls on people, a pretty ugly history. And it, it always seems that scientists are absolutely secure that the knowledge they have at this point in time is truly scientific and it's not culturally constructed or it's not biased. How do you guard against the, you know, that kind of self-delusion that seems to uh, tend to a lot of past scientific interventions into society? Yeah, it's a very important question. I think in general, scientists are and have been pretty smart about trying not to scream ahead of their moral compass on these sorts of things. Uh, and that was as true with the prefrontal lobotomy as it was with the uh, with development of nuclear arms. I mean, the scientists who were at the forefront of developing that became the people who were at the forefront of the movements to limit nuclear proliferation. So I think scientists in general are, are, are sort of s smart about trying to be cautious about this stuff. What I like about the rehabilitation methods that I'm working on right now is they've got tremendous libertarian appeal because they are only offering methods for someone to change themselves, someone to tip the balance of the battle between their long-term decision making and their uh, impulses. So it allows you to be a better decision maker. It's not the government going in and doing some sort of psychosurgery on you. It's you, if you're choosing to, learning how to defer gratification for longer-term strategy. 
David, thanks for talking to us. We've been talking with David Eagleman of Baylor and the author of the uh, wonderful book, Some. I'm Nick Gillespie for Reason TV.